Well, welcome to this webinar on instructing our kids in sound theology. For those of you who I haven't met before, my name is Elizabeth Urbanowitz, and I run Foundation Worldview, which is a ministry that's designed to equip Christian adults with the skills that they need to get the kids God has placed in our care to carefully evaluate every idea they encounter and understand the truth of the biblical worldview. And I'm really excited for this webinar today because I think it's a really important topic for us to cover, to understand how we can do this with our kids. Now, it was a little bit over a year ago when I was doing some consulting work with a school in Ohio and a teacher approached me and she asked me if I had ever seen this book series before, this Dream Traveler's Quest series by Ted Decker. And I said that I had not seen it before, but um, I had I, well, I hadn't read it before, but I had seen it advertised on Facebook. It was continually in my Facebook newsfeed. And the teacher said to me, you know, I have it in my classroom library and it's a kid's Christian fiction book, but there's something that's just off and I can't tell what's off. She said, I think I'm going to pull them out of my classroom library. And she very graciously gave me the books. And as I was reading through the books, I was very surprised because these books are advertised as kids' Christian fiction. They're also advertised in Christian book distributors. However, when you read through these books, you see so so many incorrectly represented Christian doctrines that these books that are written for kids ages eight to 12, they have an incorrect understanding of the nature of God, that in these books it's presented as if God is in all, not as in the Holy Spirit residing in us, but as if God is in every person, every tree, every plant. Also, there's an incorrect understanding of sin that the main problem with the characters in the book is not their sin, but that they're failing to realize how beautiful they are. And then because of that, there's also an incorrect understanding of the nature of redemption or salvation, that in this series of books, what the kids are instructed to do is not to repent of their sin and to turn and trust in Christ, but they have to realize that they are beautiful. They are the light of the world. They need to love themselves. And once they do this, all their problems disappear. And so uh, it was about a year ago now, that I actually did a book review on YouTube, just warning Christian parents that these books are actually not Christian fiction because they are not rooted in sound Christian doctrine, but helping those understand how we could actually use these books if we have them in our homes or our schools or our classrooms, how we can use these books to teach kids sound theology and sound critical thinking. And books like this and so many other things in our culture just reveal how important it is that we ground our children in true theology, in a correct understanding of who God is and the world that he has designed. And so that's why I'm so excited for our time today, where we're going to be talking about how we can actually ground our children in sound doctrine. And here to help me with this discussion today is my friend, author, and professor of theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Dr. Greg Allison. So please welcome Dr. Allison with me. And Dr. Allison, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Wonderful to be with you, Elizabeth. And I just hear your passion for sound theology, particularly equipping uh, adults, parents to uh, teach mm -hmm. sound theology to their kids. So I really appreciate having the opportunity to be with you and the audience. Oh, thanks so much, Dr. Allison. Well, for those of you watching and listening, we actually, Dr. Allison has written many, many books, but one of his books we featured in this month's Foundation Worldview Book Club, and that is 50 Core Truths of the Christian Faith, A Guide to Understanding and Teaching theology. And if you haven't checked out this book through the Foundation Worldview Book Club yet, highly recommend that you do so because it's going to just kind of undergird everything that we talk about today. It's not like your typical theology textbook where it might take you three years to read through it if you're not a seminary student and you might have trouble understanding it. It's in layman's terms. So highly recommend you grab a copy of this book. So we're going to talk about some of the things that Dr. Allison has included in this book. So Dr. Allison, before we get started, I would just love for you to define the term theology, because I know for many Christians, this can sound like a very intimidating term and like, oh, you know, like I'm not in seminary, I'm not a pastor. So can you just tell us what theology is? <laughs> Absolutely. Very simply put, it's uh, the study of God and his ways. Mm -hmm. And all of us then as believers uh, should be interested in theology because we want to know what the Bible says about who God is and about his ways in this world. Even as you mm -hmm. pointed out, uh, wrong theology would say God is in everything, that mm -hmm. sin is not that important, and salvation is just 
thinking good things about yourself. That's not sound theology. So theology is just basically uh, the study of God and his ways. Oh, I love that definition because it's so nice and easy. So for those of you who are watching or listening, this is a really simple definition that we can give our children. You know, we can understand this definition, but also our kids can. That, you know, anytime we have an ology word, we know it's the study of something, you know, biology, psychology, anthropology. So ology is just the study of, and then theology is the study of God and his ways. And so that's a definition that any of our kids can understand. And Dr. Ellison, I like how you just pointed out, you know, connected to the story that I told initially that there is theology that could be incorrect theology. And it's actually true theology, sound theology that we want to make sure that we are grounded in. And that's what you're emphasizing. This is sound theology mm -hmm. that we want to embrace and hold for ourselves very dearly and mm -hmm. teach our kids. Yes, absolutely. So as you have spent your life studying sound theology and diving into who God is and his ways, and then you write a lot of books, you write academic books, but you also write books for the average lay person. And I know that you're involved, you know, in your local church and in your community. And so from your perspective, why is sound theology important for the everyday Christian or even for the everyday child growing up in a Christian home? Why is sound theology important? So Christians in their uh, neighborhoods, kids in their uh, uh, classrooms are constantly being bombarded about with false ideas about God and his ways. And mm -hmm. so can be very confused by what they hear from their teachers, what they uh, hear on social media. And so sound theology is essential for parents as they raise their kids and for their, for their kids as they uh, engage in school, as they live their life. They need to be grounded in true truth about who God is mm -hmm. and what his ways actually are. Oh, I love that. They need to be grounded in true truth about who God is and what his ways are. And this is actually one of the things that led me to start Foundation Worldview, just noticing, you know, even in my classroom, that my students were just bombarded with so many ideas that were contrary in nature to the Christian worldview. And they really had a difficult time just kind of wading through them and sifting through, you know, what is true and what is not true. And I think because we live, um, well, at least you and I, and maybe not everybody watching and listening, but because we live in the U S that for so long has had such a large percentage of people who claim to be Christians, it's really easy, I think, for, you know, just the everyday average Christian, as well as Christian kid, to think, you know, like, oh, as long as something has, like, the Christian label on it, then it's safe. So, you know, like, if it's Christian, it's good. If it's not Christian, it's bad. Where we know because of God's common grace, you know, even non-believers can, can know true things and teach true things about who God is. But just because something has the name Christian on it doesn't mean that it actually aligns with scripture. So as you have been a seminary professor, you know, you've taught different parts of theology. And then, you know, even as a dad and as a grandparent, what are some, you know, parts of theology that you think are really important for Christians to understand and then to pass along to their children? I think the key, most essential doctrine uh, or aspect of sound theology is who God is in terms of being the Trinity. That mm. God eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, there's three distinct persons, but one God. I think there's lots of confusion mm. in our homes, in our families, even in our churches, about the very identity of God. So mm. that to me is foundational. And then connecting back with what you said earlier, then how does this triune God act in the world to save sinners as they mm -hmm. recognize their sin, as they repent of it, as they embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ? How is it that God applies the work of Christ to their lives that flows mm -hmm. from our understanding of who God is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how that triune God rescues us out of desperation and sin? Hmm. So interesting, because I think for so many Christians, you know, the Trinity, I mean, for all of us, to some to some degree, the Trinity is a mystery, you know, and that God is completely other 
than us, that we are not God. He is not us. Um, and I think for so many Christians, it, the Trinity just kind of seems like this mathematical conundrum that, you know, like somehow three equals one, but we're not exactly sure. And we're moving on. Why can you kind of drill down a little bit deeper into that and explain why do you think that it is so important for Christians to understand the Trinity? You've explained that a little bit and that we have to have a correct understanding of the Trinity in order to understand salvation and God's work in the world. But can you kind of dive down a little deeper, unpack that for us? Sure. Uh, there's only one true living God, mm -hmm. and that God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it impacts us just at the level of who is it that we worship. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not like Muslims worshiping Allah. We're not like Hindus worshiping multiple gods and goddesses, right? We're Christians who worship the one true living God who reveals himself in his word as eternally Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So for us to worship God, for us to know God, for us to be rescued by God, we need to understand who he is. And mm -hmm. then secondly, when we read in the Bible, for example, the Father sent the Son because he loved us so that the Son would die on the cross and rise again, and the Holy Spirit then convicts us of sin, mm -hmm. and he adopts us, and he uh, redeems us, he regenerates us, we, we have to understand the dynamic of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together to rescue us from sin. So, so those are just mm -hmm. some very basic things about why this is so important. Yeah. No, I thank you so much just for explaining that and for pointing that out. And for those of you watching and listening who are working with kids and you're thinking, oh, great, Elizabeth, you know, now I have to explain this to my children. How in the world do I do this? There's a few things that I want to recommend. One, one thing that we're always recommending at Foundation Worldview is get kids into scripture. Get kids into scripture. Even if you have a three-year-old at home, before bed at night, you can start reading scripture and you will be surprised at how much they actually pick up. That you get, Yes, there are good things about children's Bibles. Those can be helpful, but get kids into scripture. Another really helpful resource in just teaching sound theology is the New City Catechism that it actually has kids memorize questions and answers. And I actually saw the benefit of these two things um, a few years ago when I was babysitting for my pastor's children. At the time, they had three kids. I think they were probably five, three, and two or one. And I was reading through the Gospel of John with them, just where their parents had left off. That was what we were supposed to do for the nighttime routine. And we were reading one time when Jesus was praying to the Father. And so that we're reading that, and the five-year-old goes, wait. So Jesus is praying to himself. And I was like, oh, that is such a good question. And so I knew that they had memorized the New City Catechism. I said, okay, can you tell me how many persons are there in the one true and living God? And their three-year-old piped in and she said, there are three persons in the one true and living God, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And I said, right, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, three persons in one God. And I said, okay, so who is Jesus? And we talked through that. Jesus is the Son the second person in the Trinity, who is he praying to? He's praying to the Father through the Spirit. So, oh my goodness, look at all three people in the persons in the Trinity are involved. And so that, that's just one thing I recommend. Get your kids in scripture, start memorizing the New City Catechism or one like it because it's a great way to teach sound theology. And then if you're interested in diving down deeper into understanding the Trinity in our early childhood worldview curriculum at Foundation Worldview, we actually have an entire lesson on the Trinity. And what we do is we cover some heresies that are not or inaccurate pictures of the Trinity, how God is not three different. It's not the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are not three different modes of God and God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, are not three different parts of God. And then we give kids different analogies and we say, how are these different than the Trinity? Are these three different parts making one? And that's not like the Trinity or these three different modes of one thing, which is not like the Trinity. So those are just three great resources would recommend if you want to dive down deep into this. Um, can so, I, okay, can so, I second those? Yes. Can I second those? Oh. <laughs> the, the catechism, right? Yeah. So my four-year-old grandson has almost memorized the whole New City Catechism for wow. kids. And so he can repeat those answers. Does he understand them very much? No, but no. he's four years old. When he turns 14, when he turns 24, those truths that he's taken in his heart, uh, they will become more alive, more vivid. And we're just laying a, a, a foundation of a Christian worldview, aren't we? Just to Yep. to, to uh, capitalize on that. And I was teaching the Trinity to fourth graders, right? And so I, I just did the basic triangle with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I said, 
there's always been a special relationship between the father and the son. And then mm -hmm. someone raised their hand. One of the four year olds, uh, fourth graders raised her hand and said, is that why the father sent the son to die on the cross for our sin? And I go, wow. that's exactly right. And someone else, another fourth grader raises his hand and goes, what about that third dude over there, the Holy Spirit? <laughs> well, there's always been a special relationship between the father, the son and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. They didn't get that's why what happened at Pentecost, the father and the son mm -hmm. poured out the spirit. But the groundwork is laid and our kids can absorb these things at their appropriate level. So yes, kudos oh. for people who want to catechize their kids. Yes, love that example. Love that example, just how you were teaching that. And all of a sudden, you know, the pieces are starting to come together. They see it. Together. They, yep, it, it, uh, it causes them to understand, yep. Yep, and that's that's what you'll start to see. And for the, for anybody watching or listening who you think like, I'm not even sure I really understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, that's why, again, I uh, recommend this book, 50 Core Truths. There are other great books too. And I think Dr. Allison's most recent or upcoming book is on the Trinity. Can you tell us the name of that book, Dr. It's Allison? It's on the Holy Spirit. It's called oh, God. Oh, the Holy Spirit, sorry. <laughs> God, Gift, and Guide, Knowing the Holy Spirit. Right, so what, what about that third dude over there, right? As, as the fourth <laughs> grader asked me, we, we're confused about the Holy Spirit. We may be fearful mm. of the Holy Spirit. We might not know much about the Holy Spirit. We know about God the Father and God the Son, but what about that third dude? So it's a, a book uh, written for uh, lay people, and mm. it's trying to unpack how do we worship God the Holy Spirit, how do we walk with God the Holy Spirit, and how do we work with God the Holy Spirit? So uh, trying to help us understand the so-called forgotten God, the Holy Spirit. Love it. Love it. So that's another resource to check out. And then for all, also just for those of you watching and listening, just would encourage you as in your own personal time reading through scripture, you can do this with yourself as adults or with your families or in your churches, you know, where whatever the ministry context God has placed you in, just start looking as you're reading scripture passages where the Trinity is referenced. Like, no, the word Trinity is never in the Bible, but as you start to just look for where is this specifically talking about the father or the son or the spirit, I think you'd be really shocked. I know I have been, I'm currently working my way through memorizing the book of Ephesians and I'm halfway through up to through chapter five right now. And there have been so many places in Ephesians where I've been like, Oh my goodness, that's the Trinity in this, in this verse. You know, these are all three persons of the Godhead mentioned in this passage. So as we continue to think about sound theology and instructing our kids in sound theology, you really laid, I think, a good foundation that we really need to make sure that our children have a solid understanding of the nature of God, specifically the nature of the Trinity. And then you talked about how that, uh, you know, really, that's really the foundation for understanding the nature of salvation and how salvation is accomplished and also applied in our lives. When you think of other things, are there other certain doctrines that you would really encourage parents or Christian educators or church leaders to make sure that is covered um, in a thorough way with children? I think the doctrine of the church uh, is mm. very important. Um because if you're a Christian, you are, or you sh certainly should be involved in a local church. So what's the nature of the church? Not just what are the ministries of the church, not just what the mm -hmm. church does, but what is it? Who composes the church? And then what are the ministries of the church and how the church is led? What are the roles of pastors, deacons, deaconesses, lay people? Um, how about the ordinances of baptism of the Lord's Supper? I assume mm -hmm. most of our audience is involved in the church. I think that's a very key doctrine. And particularly in our contemporary uh, situation, understanding the nature of human beings mm -hmm. and uh, who we are created as divine image bearers, image bearers of God, created as either male image bearers or female image bearers. This is so important, particularly for our adolescents as they're bombarded with the philosophy, the worldview of transgenderism and the whole idea that you can make up your identity. You know, some of the audience may have heard of furries, right? Kids who under think that they're cats. This is completely against the Christian worldview of divine image bearing as either men or women. And so teaching our kids those foundational truths as they go to school today, I, I think is a, a very much essential. Yes. Yes. Those of you who have followed Foundation Worldview for a while, you know that we're wholeheartedly agreeing with everything that Dr. Allison <laughs> um, just said right there. And I think just to unpack a little bit more what Dr. Allison was saying, you know, like about the nature of humans as being image bearers that are made distinctly male or distinctly 
female that we want to, with our little ones, we first want to really catechize with that, that, you know, like we're memorizing scripture and we're talking through understanding that part of being an image bearer is being male or being female and being male or female has nothing to do with your likes or your dislikes or your skills or your gifting. It has to do with the biology that God has given us. Um, and then the roles that he's given us within the church and within the family. And those are really beautiful things. And actually, before Dr. Ellis and I went live, we were just talking about different things we were reading. And we were talking about some of the science behind this, about, you know, the whole transgender phenomenon and how, you know, there, there's there's a, a not a debate right now, but we're running into lots of difficulties where when someone is biologically female, but has transitioned to be male, what happens medically, you know, because there's certain things that, you know, certain dosages of medication, there's also certain vaccines that are needed, there's, you know, different treatments based on our biology. And so how this anti-reality worldview, not, it not only contradicts scripture, it just contradicts the world around us. And that's what the next step, you know, after we've catechized little ones, we want to help the older ones, kids eight on up, see, okay, this is the truth we have learned in God's word. And then look at what the science is saying. Oh my goodness, they're lining up. Who would have thought that, that they actually line up and point to the same thing. And then I'm so grateful, Dr. Ellison, that you brought up the doctrine of the church, because I think a lot of times, especially in the United States, this can get very confused because we tend to think of church as a building that, mm -hmm. and then, you know, an organization that's meant to meet our needs. And if we're not satisfied with it, well, then you just find another one, you know, as if it was another school or another house or another job. So could you tell us a little bit, um, just what is the doctrine of the church and what is the church and what, what are some important things for our kids to know there? Yeah. So let's start with the nature of the church. What is the church, right? The mm -hmm. church is uh, composed of followers of Jesus Christ who have heard the gospel, repented of their sins, embraced Jesus Christ as their savior. And I'm just gonna emphasize one element here. Jesus has baptized every believer with the spirit to incorporate every believer into the church of Jesus Christ, his body. So whether we acknowledge it or not, every believer who is in Christ is at the same time in the church, which should be mm -hmm. expressed in membership in a local church. So we're the assembly of believers who are united in Jesus Christ into his body. And together we gather to worship the Lord and to disciple and teach and mentor and help one another as we edify the church, build one another up in Christ. And as we engage missionally outside the church with our neighbors in our city, around the world, through evangelism, caring for the poor, engaging in missions, so that's very briefly the doctrine of the nature of the church. And then we get into different ministries of the church as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, no, I love the way that you said that so succinctly, just understanding who is part of the church and what the church is actually, you know, that it's not just a building, but it does involve, it's, you know, those who have, you, as you said, heard the gospel, repented of their sin, trusted in Christ, are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. You know, he's the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Mm -hmm. And then it's expressed through membership in a local church and what that looks like. And so this is something that's so important for our children to understand what the church is, because if our children are believers or become believers, that is the reality in which they stand. And we want to make sure that they understand that, that they're not thinking of the church as some organization, as if it were a school or a soccer club or something else, but it's this actual entity, a metaphysical and physical entity that exists. So love the way that you put that, Dr. Allison. Well, one question I was thinking of, um, as I was thinking of just what I wanted to cover in this interview is I think sometimes it's easy for us to get confused about what our primary doctrines, like that all Christian, you know, that, that ortho, all Orthodox believers need to hold to and then secondary doctrines where there might be some disagreement and some differences, but Christians can genuinely be Christians and still hold to some different doctrines. Um, so could you kind of just talk us through what are some of the primary doctrines versus secondary doctrines? And then how do we tell the difference between the two? That's an excellent question. Uh, primary and uh, secondary doctrines. That doesn't mean the secondary doctrines are unimportant. But right. just in, in comparison with the primary ones, they, they would take a second place. The primary ones, uh, who is God? What is he like? Mm -hmm. And we've already talked about God being triune and God being all powerful, everywhere present, all knowing, loving, 
uh, just, holy, uh, wrathful, jealous, righteous. So who God is, what his nature is, and the fact that he's triune. And then the person and work of Jesus Christ, uh, the mm -hmm. son of God, the second person of the Trinity, about 2,000 years ago, took on the fullness of human nature. He became the God, man, Emmanuel, God with us, the son incarnate who then died on the cross for our sins and rose again to accomplish salvation on our behalf and the person and work of the Holy Spirit. He's the third person of the Trinity. He's not the forgotten God. He's not junior God, just hoping that the father and the son will one day invite him from the squad, the, the junior varsity squad to become a real member of the Trinity. He's fully <laughs> God, right? And so, and his work in our life to convict us of sin regenerate us, adopt us, the spirit of adoption that cries out, Abba, Father, our sanctification, our assurance of salvation. Mm -hmm. So who uh, Christ is, the who is the spirit. Going back to your discussion at the very beginning, what is sin and why mm -hmm. it is so serious, why it is so heinous, and the fact that we are guilty before God and we're corrupt in our nature. And the only hope is for rescue through Jesus Christ, the good news. And then the incorporation into the church. And I would add then the hope of Jesus's return and ultimately the new heavens and the new earth. Those would be some mm -hmm. of the key essential doctrines. And then secondary doctrines might be when exactly is going, Christ going to return? Is he going mm -hmm. to return at the end of the church age uh, before a millennium kingdom? Or maybe there's no millennium kingdom. There's only the new heavens and the new earth. Um, th those kinds of issues. Uh, the baptism is an essential matter, doctrine and practice, but mm -hmm. we have both credo baptists, so believers baptism, mm -hmm. and pedo baptism, so baptism of infants, right? So there's a difference of how we apply this, but we all agree on baptism. Same thing with the Lord's mm -hmm. Supper. So those mm -hmm. would be some secondary issues, I would say. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's very helpful, um, especially for those of you watching and listening. The reason that I asked Dr. Allison that question is because as those working with children, I think we we need to um, we need to hold intention to things that those primary doctrines, you know, the nature of God, the nature of sin, the nature of salvation, all of those things. Those our children need to understand that these are doctrines that in order to actually be within the Christian faith, someone has to adhere to because these these are the essentials of the Christian faith. Or then there are other things like Dr. Allison said, you know, baptism is essential in that it's commanded very clearly in scripture. However, believers have disagreements over the mode of baptism, whether it's infant baptism, you know, with bringing children into a covenant community or whether it's believers baptism as a profession of faith. And so if we take secondary doctrines and lead our kids to believe that they're primary, like if we go to a church that believes in infant baptism or adult bapt or, you know, believers baptism, and we tell our kids that Christians only believe this, <laughs> you know, and then eventually they're, they're exposed to other ideas and they realize, wait a minute, there are other people out there that claim to be Christians that don't believe the same thing. They're going to get very confused then when they encounter something like this book that I mentioned that is not Christian at all. <laughs> and they're going to think, oh, maybe Christianity is just kind of, you know, like whatever you want to believe. So it's really important that as we're teaching our kids different doctrines, we make sure that we're helping them understand this is something that the Bible is very clear on. It's the foundation of our faith. All Christians must believe this. If someone does not believe this, this places them outside the realm of the historic Christian worldview. Or then with the secondary doctrines, like when we're talking about the end times, or we're talking about modes of baptism, things like that, that we can tell our kids, Hey, this is, we know that, that we're called to be baptized. We know that Jesus is returning, you know, things like that. But then within the Christian community, there are Christians who believe different things. That doesn't mean that you can't teach them what you believe and why you believe it. You can do that. And you can lay out that argument and say, this is why we believe in infant baptism, or this is why we believe in believers baptism, but just so that they know that there are brothers and sisters in the Lord who hold to something different. And they also understand why you hold the position that you hold. 
Um, I'm going to ask one final question, but before I do that, just as a reminder to those of you who are watching and listening live, if you have questions over anything that we have said or anything we have not said, <laughs> um, and you would like to ask them just as a reminder to put them in the questions tab in around three to five minutes, we'll start to get to those. And just remember only you can see your question. Don't put it in the chat because that's not where we take questions from. <laughs> okay. So just as we're wrapping things up, uh, Dr. Ellison, what I started off this discussion, you know, just by mentioning the incorrect doctrines in that Ted Decker series for kids. And so as you have interacted with your students and just people in the church, and I'm sure you've had to wade through a lot of different ideas about God and just about Christian doctrine that are not true and help people gain a true understanding of correct doctrine. Are there any tools that you have found to be very helpful in preparing Christians to recognize a false doctrine or recognize, you know, a doctrine that just might veer from the truth slightly. I think the key thing, primary thing is to read good sound theology books so that mm -hmm. you're grounded in, in the truth of God's word and his ways in this world. So mm -hmm. catechisms like new city catechism, some basic systematic theology books like Wayne Grudem's systematic theology book, mm -hmm. Uh, Eric Tonis's, um, uh, uh Systematic Theology book, little book on life's uh, biggest questions. These are excellent resources, which most of these would also include, and here's the second point, um, exposure of wrong doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, so not only do we need to be skilled to recognize what true doctrine is, but then we also need to be uh, uh, clued into where... Um, doctrines can sound very much like true doctrine, but there's a little bit off and there's something wrong. Uh, and so mm -hmm. we need to be alerted to that fact. And I think key to all this too is once we've embraced uh, true doctrine, sound doctrine, it, it's not just a matter of our head, but it needs to trickle down into our heart so mm -hmm. that we're practicing what we believe. We are living out the reality of God who is triune. So um, we see in our worship service, when we baptize people, we baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. That, that, that's a, a key application of the doctrine of the Trinity as we gather together and celebrate a baptism. Or the whole idea of God helps us uh, through his Son and his Spirit who are interceding for us. They're praying mm -hmm. for us in our times of desperation. What does that mean? Well, when we're undone, we, we are, uh, we're, yes, we are challenged, we're, we're uh, perplexed, and yet we trust God that mm -hmm. his son and his spirit are praying on our behalf, and, mm -hmm. we, and, and God is going to listen, and he will give us everything that we need. So not only do we need to uh, grasp for ourselves and hold to sound doctrine and be aware and repudiate false doctrine, but we need to live out the truths of the sound mm. doctrine that we embrace. When we have that life that's in conformity with sound doctrine, I think we have a sense, an intuition, a smell of something that's not right. And mm. uh, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Yes. No, I love, I love how you said that it's so important that we know the sound doctrine, you know, that we're reading sound theology but then also that we're living it out. Because I think as Christians, we tend to be tempted in one of two ways, either to, you know, like not really study at all and not know a whole lot about who God is and what scripture says and what sound theology is, and just to go with our subjective emotional experience. And then we can be very passionate about God and passionate about what we're doing, but we might not even be worshiping God as he has commanded us to worship him. And we might not even be worshiping him if we're worshiping a God of our own choosing. So that's very dangerous. And then the other end of the extreme is learning so much about who God is and how he has ordered the world, but without letting that actually transform who we are. For those of you who follow Foundation Worldview, you know that our upcoming curriculum in July is an Attributes of God curriculum for little ones. And this is actually the way that we have ordered this in that we have the first half is on God's incommunicable attributes, the attributes he alone possesses. And then the second half is his communicable attributes, those that he chooses to share with us. He chooses to let us reflect him in that way. And we have two lessons that teach. We have one lesson and then another lesson that teach attributes of God. And then the third lesson is how do we live that out? 
And then we do that over and over and over again, two attributes of God. And then how do we live that out? Because we don't want to just have our kids have their heads full of knowledge without really having their lives transformed. And then the other thing that I want to recommend, I know Dr. Allison brought, uh, you brought up a number of books that people can read. And that's why, again, I'm just really passionate about this 50 core truths book that, um, that you've written because I'm, pa I'm a theology nerd. I'm single and I don't have any children of my own. So I have lots of time to read and I love reading really heady books, but I know my mom is so gracious when I started first started off on this journey of apologetics and I'd be recommending books to her. She'd be like, Elizabeth, am I going to understand them? And my mom is very bright. She just, you know, she doesn't um, have quite the academic bending bent that I do. And when I found this book, I said, mom, I found the theology book that you need to buy <laughs> because this book does exactly Dr. Allison, what you just described. It goes through, you know, is this a primary doctrine? Is this a secondary doctrine? Where is it in scripture? What are the things different Christians believe? What are different heresies that actually veer from correct Christian doctrine. And then at the end of each chapter, there is further reading resources. So that's why I really, really love this book. Was there anything else before we transition over into a time of questions? Was there anything else that I didn't ask you that you wanted to share or anything else that you'd like to close with? Uh, let me just encourage uh, those who are listening to us uh, to continue to listen to these webinars that Elizabeth is presenting. She really has her pulse uh, on scripture and sound theology, and also the cultural realities that uh, you and uh, your children face. And that combo is really potent. We need both poles of that. And so this is a great resource. A Foundation Worldview is a great resource to equip you to, to live and to parent and to raise kids who will love God and follow his ways. Oh, well, thank you very much for that encouragement, Dr. Allison. I appreciate that. Just as a little bit of housekeeping. Also, I see we don't have too many questions. So if you um, have a question, this is your time to get it in right now. Um, just as a little bit of housekeeping, our next webinar coming up is on Tuesday, May 2nd at 1 p.m. Central. And this is going to, the title of this webinar is When Our Kids' Schedules Keep Them from Jesus. So this is going to be a time where we're going to be looking at how do we schedule the time that God has given us with these children that he's placed in our care? And what can we do to make sure that we are faithfully discipling them with the time that we have them in our homes and our churches and our schools? And then also, as I mentioned before, the Attributes of God curriculum is coming out in July of 2023. Um, it's already up on our website. You can sign up to get uh, in notified when it is actually released. So we'll transition over into our time of questions. So our first question says, the church is very divided in what we believe. We don't speak with one voice. How do we point out the errors of other Christian churches to our children without appearing judgmental or arrogant? So Dr. Allison, what are your thoughts on that? The, um, the church is divided. Uh, we see that denominationally. Uh, mm -hmm. We see it even within our own local churches, there's division. I would strongly suggest before we focus on what divides us is to see, focus mostly on what unites us. Mm -hmm. That the things we've talked about today, God is triune, who Jesus Christ is, the work of the spirit, our identity as image bearers fallen into sin, salvation through his uh, blood and resurrection, the church and so forth. There, are, There's so much that unites us. And, and mm -hmm. I think we can, we can help one another to overcome these divisions by saying, but look at what, what unites us. So as, as we're, you're working with your, your children, your adolescent uh, students, your, your, your kids, uh, make sure not to lose what, what the commonalities are. And then what about the, the points of difference? Face those square on. But mm -hmm. as uh, Elizabeth has been urging you, and I would urge you too, constantly have your reference point in scripture and show why those divisions exist, why those divisions exist because of different interpretations of passages or maybe how passages that relate to the doctrine, how they're put together differently, because you want to train your kids to always go back to the touchstone of scripture. That's mm -hmm. our ultimate mm -hmm. authority. So not even what you tell them, right, is the ultimate authority. Right? Keep going back to scripture, show them how to properly interpret it and put together 
uh, passages of scripture. That's why you believe pedo baptism or why you believe credo baptism, but um, uh, but always grounded in scripture and help them to understand where do the divisions come from without ever losing sight of the fact that we are united on so much. Mm-hmm. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you said there, Dr. Ellison, that I think that is, you know, the end of this question says how, you know, how do we do that without being judgmental or arrogant? And I think exactly what you said by pointing out what unites us, putting the focus there and then rooting it back into scripture. Like you said, you know, this is why we believe what we believe. Sorry. And, and, and we can go back. We can say, you know, the church almost from the outset has had different views on things like baptism and the Lord's Supper and, the you know, how mm-hmm. God holds us accountable for our sin. It is, there's, there's always been a, a spectrum around these commonalities. And so what we face today is nothing new. Maybe the differences are more pronounced and, and people are more uncivil and unkind mm. in addressing it. But the church has always had these tensions. And yet, look, at we're still thriving and flourishing 2,000 years from our inception. And the gospel is going out throughout the world, right? And, and God is saving people and he's planting churches and he's developing uh, what he wants to do in this world even though we have these tensions and differences surrounding our commonalities, uh, but, but God is the promise of Jesus. I will build my church uh, mm. is forever. And he is going to do that. And so we should acknowledge that with humility, but also with conviction where the differences lie. Yes. Amen. Great advice. And then I would just add to that just on a really practical level, start opening up your home to other believers, <laughs> start opening up your home to your church, start practicing biblical hospitality, have different families in your church, start loving other people. Well, have families in your community who belong to a different denomination over just for the purpose of building relationship. And so that way, when you're talking about these ideas with your children, they're not just these abstract concepts, but they can, they're actually attached to a person, you know, or people. And you can say, you know, we disagree over this, you know, we disagree with this family or we disagree with this person or this couple, but you know what, we're still Christians. We're still part of the family of God and we can love one another. So on a really, just really practical level, just start opening up your home, (laughs) having others in your home. That's one of the things, whenever there's um, conflict between people in my church, one of the first things our pastor will ask is, have you had them over for dinner yet? (laughs) Because it's amazing. Once you start investing in the lives of other people, um, you know, you still have to work through conflict. You still have to work through tension. It doesn't dissolve, but it's a, it, looked at a completely different way when you actually are actively building relationship and loving one another as God has called us to. And, and differences on these uh, matters does not equal we can't be friends, right? right? We, we can be friends and still disagree. For example, one of my dear colleagues, Tom Schreiner, New Testament professor, he has a certain view of spiritual gifts that's different from mine. Mm-hmm. And yet in my latest book on the Holy Spirit, I interact with him. And I wanted mm-hmm. to do so fairly in a balanced way with great respect, but showing where we dif- disagree. We're dear friends. Uh, we swim together uh, often. So uh, you can be friends and still have differences, but, you, but you're kind and humble and mm. respect and love one another. That's, we really need that today in our churches. Yep. I love that. I love that. Don't buy into this cultural lie that you need to wholeheartedly agree with everyone <laughs> in order to be in relationship with them. There's unity amidst diversity in the if, body. If there's no Christ. disagreement, if if you're the if, if if you're always right, everybody else is redundant, right? <laughs> <laughs> love that. Okay, next question. Um, how would you explain to kids why different churches arrive? at different secondary views. For example, we go to a church that practices believer's baptism and will give scripture to back that stance. But my dad is a pastor at a church that practices infant baptism and he can defend that with scripture as well. Good question. How, how would you address that, Dr. Ellison? Uh, yes, uh, so I'm a uh, hold to believer's baptism. Um, and so I think that is the teaching of scripture because um, the early church, as we read about it in Acts, um, baptized believers following their understanding, the grasp of the gospel, repentance, and their faith in Jesus. But I also understand um, 
this uh, person who holds to pedobaptism could turn to Acts 2.38, for example, and talk about the promise of salvation is was not only for Peter's hearers, but also for their children and those who are far off. And so the idea of my pedobaptist friends is that, yes, God has made baptism for believers, but also for their children. And then they point to household baptisms like Lydia at the end of or the middle of Acts chapter 16. Lydia and her household embraced the good news and were baptized. And the assumption is there were children or infants in her household. Uh, and same thing with the Philippian jailer at the end of Acts chapter 16. So I love my pedo Baptist friends and, and brothers and sisters. I, I understand where they come from. I have deep respect for the view. I, I interpret those passages differently, uh, but this is the way uh, the differences arise, how we interpret key passages and then specifically how we put all the relevant passages together. That will lead to differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good example um, that you gave just with the different scriptures that are brought to this. So for this person who's asking this question, you know, how would you explain to your kids? I would just do exactly what Dr. Ellison just modeled and, you know, take them through the passages of scripture that, you know, support the conviction that you have for believers baptism and then explain this is why we believe that and then you can take them to the passages um that your dad believes and then say you know like, this is how you know grandpa or pop up or you know whatever you call him this is how he would explain that and then explain to them why you think scripture points to your view but then circle back and say but you know what is grandpa or you know whatever whatever you call him is he a christian yes is he serving jesus yes we have these differences of opinion is one right and one wrong Yes, but you know what? We're never going to be 100% sure until Jesus comes back. But we know that we can both be Christians with believing these. For those of you who are wondering, like, how do I even do this with my kids? How do I teach them, you know, to weigh the evidence behind things? If you check out our careful thinking curriculum at Foundation Worldview, we actually have, you know, just a whole unit that goes through, you know, how do we weigh the evidence behind an idea and what happens when there's, you know, contradictory evidence for something. Um, but Love the response that you gave for that, Dr. Allison. Okay, next question. In light of how this program started, um, I'm assuming you're saying foundation. Oh, oh, this program with this book. <laughs> um, do you have any recommendations for Christian youth fiction? Uh, great question. Actually, it's um, it's interesting. There's not a whole ton out there. Um, I've actually been approached by a number of publishing houses recently asking me to write Christian youth fiction, and that is not my wheelhouse. So <laughs> I've pointed them to other skilled um, skilled authors. But yes, there is there is difficulty there. So some books, some uh, first of all, I'll recommend that you sign up for our book club because every month we send out titles for four to seven year olds, eight to twelve year olds, and then adults. And for the kids ones, we send out questions worldview-based uh, questions that you can talk through with your kids as they go through those books. Just a couple series that are really good. Um, the uh, why am I blanking out on this? Oh, The Wing Feather Sagra by Andrew Peterson um, is an excellent series. Just know if you haven't read that yet, the first book, it was um, Andrew's first book. So the writing is good, but not excellent. So make it through that first book, then the writing in the rest of the three books is excellent. Um, another great series is the Green Ember series by S.D. Smith. That's another real great adventure series. And then um, one thing we're passionate about at Foundation Worldview is teaching kids to think well and to evaluate ideas. So there can actually be a real benefit in having them read non-Christian literature and asking them very specific worldview questions about it. Actually, that was one of the things that I found when I first, um, Foundation Comparative Worldview Curriculum was our first curriculum. And I wrote it for the students in my classroom with no intention of ever publishing it. But once I taught it to my students, every day at silent reading time, there was this long line of students at my desk just waiting to show me alternate worldview claims in the books that they read. So if we train our kids in sound theology in a basic understanding understanding of other worldviews and then turn them loose to read books and have good conversations with them. It's amazing the things that they can pick up on that. So that's what I recommend. Um, Wing Feather Saga, the Green Ember series, those are great ones. And then train them how to think well, and they can read non-Christian literature and evaluate it well. Um, as a dad and grandfather, do you have any recommendations, Dr. Ellison, for that? Um, Chronicles of Narnia? Yes. Yes. Um, yep. By C.S. Lewis, uh, we read that with our kids, and our kids read that with our grandkids, and oh. the grandkids <laughs> read that, you know, to themselves, and uh, so I think that's an excellent one. 
Um, but the other ones that you mentioned, that's what I was going to mention as well. My grandkids love all those books that you mentioned. So yes. thumbs up to those. Yeah, those are really good series. And then if you have kids um, that are not super enthralled with reading, but you still want to engage them in quality literature, it the Focus on the Family has amazing radio dramas of all the Chronicles of Narnia. So you can get those for your kids, Focus on the Family Radio Theater, all the Chronicles of Narnia. I listen to those over and over and over and over again. I practically have them memorized. So <laughs> those are great. Okay, um, next question is, um, it's gonna be our final question. Uh, it's a nice and easy one for you, Dr. Allison, okay. a little softball. <laughs> is there a title for your new book on the Holy Spirit that's coming out? I'm assuming, yes, that it has a title. <laughs> yes, it's uh, God, Gift, and Guide, colon, mm -hmm. Knowing the Holy Spirit. So I affirm that the Holy Spirit is God. He's the one who guides our life as we're filled with the Spirit and walk by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit and set our minds on the things of the spirit. And then um, he's God gift, uh, uh, sorry, God gift and guide. So he's the gift as well. Uh, my claim at the very beginning of the book is this, the greatest gift that God the Father gives to those who follow his son is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The greatest gift that God the Father gives to those who follow his son is the Holy Spirit. And mm -hmm. some may object, oh no, wait, the greatest gift is salvation. I agree, but notice how I phrased my claim. The greatest gift that God the Father gives to those who follow his son, who have already received the gift of salvation, mm -hmm. the greatest gift for them is the Holy Spirit. Because in, in Matthew and Luke, Jesus talks about the Father giving good gifts to his children. Mm -hmm. And in the Luke's version, he says, the great gift that God the Father gives is the Holy Spirit. And so God gift and guide, knowing the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Love that. Well, for those of you who have not been familiar with Dr. Allison's work before, I'm sure you can tell from watching this webinar that he makes sound theology very accessible for those of us everyday, average, ordinary lay people um, who are guiding children. So highly recommend that you check out the books that I've recommended here by him and that he just mentioned, but also he has many other titles out there. So Dr. Allison, thank you so very much for joining me today. It's just been a gift to have you on. And I know I've learned a lot and I'm, I know that those watching have as well. So thank you. You. Thank you, Elizabeth. So it enjoyed it. You're, you're a great host. Thank you to the audience for tuning in as well. Oh, thanks. Well, to those of you who have watched, thank you so much for giving up an hour of your day. And I look forward to seeing you next time.